Now I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Emma Morrison, whose research focuses on the structural biophysical features of nucleosomes. Uh, Dr. Morrison earned her PhD in molecular biophysics from Washington University in St. Louis, then moved to the University of Iowa as a postdoctoral fellow to work with Dr. Catherine Mosman. There, her work was focused on a combinatorial readout of histone post-translation modifications and for which her work earned a postdoctoral fellowship from the Arnold Beckman Foundation. In 2019, which already feels like a long time ago, Dr. Morrison started her own lab at the Medical College of Wisconsin, where she's now an assistant professor. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and please go ahead. All right, well, thank you very much for that introduction, Melvin, and I agree. It does indeed feel like it's been a while since I started, even though it's uh, yeah just coming up on a year now. Um, so I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of this fragile nucleosome series for the opportunity to speak together. And um, you know, I think they're they're doing a great job, and this has really been, you know, a really nice seminar series during during the whole pandemic situation. Um, so right, as Melvin mentioned, I moved to the Medical College of Wisconsin just about a year ago to start up my own research program. But most of what um, I'm going to talk today about today is work that um, from my postdoc with Catherine Musselman when we were both at the University of Iowa. Um, so my interests really lie in investigating fundamental mechanisms of um, molecular mechanisms of chromatin regulation from a biophysical and structural perspective. And so of course, chromatin is near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, so it doesn't require much of an introduction, but I just kind of want to set the stage for the framework of the questions we were approaching. And so of course we know that chromatin allows for the dynamic regulation of genes. Uh, and many of us study different mechanisms of this regulation. And so this includes a whole host of different protein machinery that's involved in regulating chromatin structure and accessibility, which includes ATP dependent uh, nucleosome remodeling complexes that shift the position or evict nucleosomes to alter the accessibility of genes. Uh, in addition, uh, histone chaperones that assemble and disassemble nucleosomes and swap out histone components. And then of course, transcriptional machinery for the expression of genes. And then on top of that, additional machinery that regulates all this other machinery. And so um, really what's at the center of all this is the nucleosome and understanding how it is that um, this vast uh, com complex network of machinery really knows uh, when and where to go um, uh, for, for their proper um, regulatory functions. And so, right, so the nucleosome is really at the, at the center of, of all of this activity. And what interests me most is in understanding how the nucleosome and its components regulate these processes and chromatin structure uh, dynamics and accessibility overall. And so, of course, the nucleosome being uh, the basic subunit of chromatin, here's just a very simplified uh, cartoon model wherein the nucleosome core part, sorry, the nucleosome core particle um, consists of two copies, each of the histones H2A, H2B, H3, and H4, around which the DNA wraps. And then what's kind of depicted um, here in the cartoon is that the N terminal and in some cases C terminal tails protrude out from the core. And these tails are of course one of the very important mechanisms used um, in regulating um, and communicating with this um, vast network of protein machinery. And um, so of course, histone post-translational modifications are one of the really important mechanisms in this. And so, and the histone tails are very heavily uh, post-translationally modified and are you know, one of the major platforms for signaling to these complexes. And so thus, it's really important for us to understand um, the structure and conformation of the histone tails within the nucleosome. Uh, because, of course, there are a lot of really great uh, crystal and cryo-EM structures. Um, and so, I, so we have a really nice view at what the nucleosome core looks like. Um, but what's um, largely not resolved in the vast majority of these structures are the histone tails. Um, and this really speaks to the fact that they're um, very conformationally heterogeneous uh, and dynamic and, and disordered. And so, um, so these, these methods just aren't ideal for, for that type of um, system. Um, and, so, and so that's really where, where my interests lie in, can we you know, get um, a better structural understanding of the histone tails within the nucleosome? 
Um, and so, you know, a, kind of the classic textbook model of the nucleosome kind of depicts them in cartoons similar to this, where they kind of show um, the histone tails extending out from the nucleosome core. And kind of the, the implications of that are that they're very accessible to binding by regulatory proteins. Um, and that they're, they're kind of acting as a bit more of a passive component um, in chromatin regulation for the deposition of signaling molecules. Um, and so, like I say, we really wanted to, to, to get a, more of a structural picture for what these tails um, look like within the nucleosome. Um, and so we had um, a paper published a couple of years ago, so I'm only going to um, kind of uh, go over this, this briefly. Oh, sorry, I also wanted to mention um, that there's been a lot of really great biochemical evidence from uh, researchers such as the Hayes Lab um, that you know, speak to the, the, the idea that this model is not correct and that the tails indeed are interacting at least transiently or maybe more with DNA. Um, and so I think our data um, is kind of helping uh, put together um, a new structural model that is very complementary to these studies. Um, and so then just to kind of go over um, kind of our conclusions from, from the um, initial paper here, um, and, and that I'm happy to talk about in more detail with anyone that would want to, um, is that um, using a combination of solution NMR and MD simulations, um, we arrived at, at a model where in under um, physiological salt conditions, the, the H3 tail is largely collapsed onto uh, the core DNA of the nucleosome. And it um, does so in a very uh, dynamic ensemble of conformations. So it's, it, some might refer to it as kind of a fuzzy complex, wherein the H3 tail adopts these bound conformations, but is uh, very dynamically moving uh, between these different conformations. Um, but of course, these tails must be undergoing some sort of an equilibrium um, to lead to accessibility um, uh, because we know where they are at least partially released from interactions with DNA um, because we, we know that they, of course, are, in, are involved in interactions with other proteins. Um, and so we, we additionally um, showed that binding of the H3 tail to a model reader domain is significantly inhibited uh, within the context of the nucleosome as compared to the peptide. And so there's, um, there's this conformational pre-equilibrium that leads to an infective inhibition of binding. And it kind of, and it serves as an additional level of regulation. And so it kind of brings up this picture or this question of, you know, what other nuclear factors are involved in shifting this equilibrium to regulate the accessibility of the tails uh, to binding? Um, and I also wanted to mention that there, there have been other labs such as the Hayes, Fischel, and Kutatilazzi labs that have made observations um, showing that the accessibility to chemical modification and um, other readers and writer domains um, has been, uh, are, is inhibited within the nucleosome. Um, and so one of, so like I say, it's, it's really interesting to think about what nuclear factors um, are involved in um, regulating this accessibility. And so one that I think um, would be a common one to think about is of course, um, charge modulating histone post-translational modifications. And, and we showed previously um, that uh, charge modulating modifications or mutations in sites remote from this, the binding interface with the reader domain um, lead to an increase in accessibility. But we, there are I'm sure you can think of, of a whole host of other nuclear factors that might be involved in regulating tail accessibility. And so another one that, that we were interested in is actually the, um, the idea of nucleosome composition or, um, and the idea that in addition to the canonical nucleosome um, that, I, that I mentioned and was talking about, there are actually subnucleosomal species um, that lack either one or both H2A, H2B dimers. Um, and there is evidence both in vitro, but also in vivo, that subnucleosomes exist um, as at least intermediates um, to nucleosome assembly and disassembly processes um, and ATP uh, driven remodeling and also transcription um, by uh, RNA polymerase. Um, and, and that it hexasomes um, um, appear to be an intermediate to transcription. Um, and so there, and then there's also evidence that these subnucleosomal particles in turn can differentially regulate 
uh, chromatin remodelers and transcriptional machinery. And so it's really interesting to think, you know, might this be another mechanism and how does the conformation of the H3 tails um, change within the context of these three different um, species of the nucleosome? Um, right, and so, and might this serve as another regulatory mechanism? Um, and so here I've kind of added in a cartoon of, of the, uh, the octosome version, the canonical nucleosome um, that I already introduced wherein we have this kind of cloud of interactions. Um, and then, but you can see here from my very simplified cartoon of these um, subnucleosomal species trying to show that the conformation of the nucleus of the DNA um, is altered upon the loss of one or both dimers. And so there's um, a lot of great studies um, that have, a number of great studies that have shown that upon each loss of dimer, um, it leads to the unwrapping of about 30 to 40 base pairs of DNAs of DNA from the side that the dimer is lost. And then that happens again um, to form the tetrasome. And so, um, and so within, um, um, within the hexasome, you end up with this asymmetric particle instead of the pseudosymmetric particle, um, wherein one um, end of DNA and thus the, um, the environment right where the H3 tail protrudes um, is, is changed. And so the question arises, now that you've changed the DNA conformation and thus the, the local DNA environment where the H3 tail um, protrudes from the core, are we affecting the conformational ensemble as well? Um, and so the, the main technique that I use to approach this question um, is solution and MR. And I just kind of want to um, uh, briefly mention that solution NMR, it's, it's an ideal technique for looking at the histone tails um, due to its unique capabilities of looking at the structure and dynamics with high resolution um, and at intrinsically disordered and dynamic um, region, regions. And so um, here I'm showing, um, well, this is to represent, I made uh, samples where I reconstituted nucleosomes um, using the um, Woodham 601 sequence and um, have all four histones present, but the H3 component alone is isotopically labeled with N15. And so I'm only going to be able to directly observe um, the histone H3. And, and this um, here is kind of, it's an amide HSQC of this sample, and it's the basic fingerprint spectrum um, of a protein. And so you can kind of think of it as, um, as a contour map where we see one peak for every backbone amide. Um, and then this is a, a bit of an oversimplification, but in general, we can think of uh, peak position it, um, as reporting on the, the structure and the peak height as reporting on the dynamics. Uh, and so when we collect an amide at HSQC on the sample, uh, you can see that we're only able to observe the and terminal tail, even though um, the whole histone is there. And so that really uh, speaks to the fact that, you know, when, um, when you have a very large particle, um, such as the nucleosome, which is about 200 kilodaltons in all, you're only going to be able to directly observe um, very mobile regions um, via solu traditional solution NMR techniques. Um, and so this technique um, is, is good for um, determining the conformation of the H3 tail. And so, I wanted to compare the conformation between the three different species. And I just want, so I reconstituted these nucleosomes with um, N15 labeled H3, um, or these different species by using different ratios of the histones, of course. And I just want to mention that Greg Bowman's lab very elegantly showed that um, hexasome reconstituted using the Widom 601 sequence preferentially forms with um, the single H2H2B dimer on the TA rich side of the DNA. So that means that we're working with a homogeneous population of hexasomes. So if I take these three um, samples with the H3 component labeled, so um, and collect that you know basic fingerprint HSQC of each sample, you can um, see here um, that they looked distinctly different. You can see just by eye before doing any sort of further analysis that this hexasome sample um, has more peaks than the other two samples. And if we uh, go through and assign 
uh, the peaks to different residues in the tail, um, you can see that, well, as before, we had assigned the nucleosome to basically through the first 36 residues of the tail. And similarly, um, we can assign the tetrasome to, through the first 37, actually, residues of the tail. Whereas in the hexasome, we actually have two peaks for uh, each residue in the tail. And this kind of um, speaks to the fact that when we look at you know, the symmetry of these particles, the nucleosome and the tetrasome are pseudosymmetric particles. And so it seems like the H3 tails are experiencing um, a um, very similar environment and, and are sampling the same conformations. Whereas the hexasome, um, the, the symmetry was broken um, as the, the DNA conformation opens up. And so it seems like we, the H3 tail is indeed um, experiencing a distinct environment um, on, on, um, between the two copies of the tail. And so we can also overlay these spectra to, to get, gain some insight into uh, the chemical shift um, of these nucleosomal species. Um, and so we can start by looking at you know, the canonical nucleosome, and I'm just zooming in on a couple of regions here. And then if I uh, bring in the tetrasome species, so the other species where the two um, uh, H3 tails experience the same environment, um, you can see that there are distinct chemical shift differences. So indicating that they are experiencing different um, conformational ensembles um, upon loss of dimer. And then I can bring in the third species, that, that asymmetric species, the hexasome, where you can see that it, it actually looks like very similar to a sum of the two spectra. And so it, it's really um, bringing, um, supporting the idea that we have actually one tail um, experiencing a near nucleosomal environment and one tail experiencing a near tetrasomal environment. Um, and so we can look at the chemical shift differences to get a feel for like the, the structural uh, similarity uh, between these different states, uh, these different species. And so you can see here that if I compare the nucleosome and the tetrasome, we have pretty large chemical shift differences along the length of the tail. So they supporting the idea that they're experiencing different uh, conformational ensembles. Um, but if I compare um, the uh, half of the tail peaks um, from the hexasome that we'll call hex N um, with the nucleosome, you see that there's actually uh, very small chemical shift differences. So, so one of the tails um, supports the idea that one of the tails is experiencing a near nucleosomal en environment. And then the other tail, um, the hex T tail, we can compare that to um, the tetrasome. And you can see that overall it experiences, um, it shows very small chemical shift differences um, that highlights some regions in the 20s where there are um, significantly larger chemical shift differences, suggesting that overall um, the hex T tail experiences um, a tetrasome uh, conformational ensemble with some differences that are probably arise from an overall um, uh, greater difference in, in the structure um, that we'll, we'll get to in just a minute. Um, but as I mentioned, so I mentioned that, you know, with these spectra, we can kind of get um, two pieces of information, the, con uh, the structure of the conformation and also the dynamics. So we can get a feel for the dynamics of, um, to look for differences in dynamics of the tails um, by looking at the um, peak intensity as a very qualitative readout of the dynamics. And so if I, if, I, um, if we look at the peak intensity of the hex N and the hex T tails within the hexasome, such that they're coming from within the same particle and thus we don't have additional complicating factors. Um, if, if I plot the intensity of the hex T in the light blue and the hex N in the, in the darker blue, you can see that overall the tetrasomal hexasome tail um, ha has a peak intensity of about half or twice that of the nucleosomal or the hex N tail. Um, and so that's showing that the hex T or the tetrasomal tail it, um, is experiencing um, significantly faster dynamics than the hex N tail. So we collaborated um, with the Wierzynski lab to get a better idea of, of kind of the conformations accessible by the H3 tail within these three different species. 
And so they um, carried out simulations of the nucleosome, hexasome, and tetrasome, wherein they started from um, an extended confirmation of the H3 tails and then conducted their simulations. And they conducted um, 10 250 nanosecond simulations um, on each of the three species. And importantly, all the simulation, in all the simulations, the H3 tails once again collapse onto the DNA uh, to interact uh, with the DNA. Um, but importantly, each simulation collapses into a distinct confirmation that still supports the idea that we have this very um, broad ensemble of, of um, the tails interacting uh, with the DNA in a, in a range of states um, and in a dynamic manner. And so we can also, so we can, we can analyze this MD simulation data in order to also get a readout on the mobility or the dynamics of the tails um, by doing here um, a root mean square fluctuation or an RMSF analysis. And when we plot this out for the tails within the three species, you can see that the, the simulation data supports an increase in the flexibility of the tetrasomal tails as compared to the nucleosomal uh, tails which is in agreement with the NMR data. But another analysis that we can uh, conduct that, that gives us some information that's rather novel than what we can pull out of, of those particular NMR experiments is to, to look at um, um, the frequency of the H3 tail interactions with different regions of DNA um, to see how, um, to see what con which, um, areas of the DNA the H3 tails are interacting in and whether the DNA confirmation um, affects, affects that. And so uh, we can see here that in nucleosome, the H3 tails interact with um, the nearby DNA on both uh, gyres of DNA. Um, so the, both the inner and the outer gyre of DNA. When the dimer, both di H2H2B dimers are lost and the DNA arms open up such that they're no longer accessible to the tails, that is of course shifted only to um, that inner gyre of DNA. However, in that asymmetric particle in the hexasome, you can see that while the wrap side still looks very similar to the nucleosome, um, the hex T side or the now unwrapped side has actually led to a shift in um, which regions of the DNA the H3 tail is interacting with. So that's interesting that indeed um, we're causing a, a shift in, in the ensemble of um, the H3 tail. And so together, the NMR and MD simulation data have really shown us that the conformational ensemble and dynamics of the H3 tail um, is regulated by nucleosome composition. But does this have an effect on the accessibility of the tails to binding and, um, and then therefore uh, biological implications uh, for signaling by the H3 tails? And so in order to um, test the accessibility of the histone tails and um, across the three different species, um, I turn to uh, trypsin digestion assays. And so this is kind of a modification to um, you know, an assay that was used for the identification of the histone tails and their boundaries. Um, but so I modified this to make it a little bit more of a, a kinetic-based experiment. Um, and so, and conducted it as a gel-based assay. So what we're doing is, is incubating um, each of the three nucleosomal species with uh, different ratios of trypsin and running them on a gel pre and post um, exposure to trypsin and then quantifying the amount of H3 remaining. Um, and so if I plot the fraction of full length H3 remaining after exposure, you can see that, um, that we can detect a difference in the accessibility of the H3 tails. Um, to proteolysis and kind of use this as a proxy for their accessibility to binding to other regulatory factors. And so in fact, at this middle um, uh, ratio of, of uh, trypsin, we, ha where we have a lot of sensitivity um, between these three species. And you can see that the tetrasomal H3 tails are significantly more um, accessible to proteolysis than the nucleosomal ones. And if I repeat this as like a full kinetic time course, such that I can uh, fit the, the decay of, um, of the full length H3 remaining, I can see here that the, the tetrasomal 
H3 tail is about an um, order of magnitude more accessible uh, to proteolysis or to trypsin than the nucleosomal H3 tail. And um, so, and then we have the hexasome data here. Now, this type of assay can't break apart the contributions from the two different tails and it's gonna average them. But if we um, go under the assumption that we have one tail experiencing a nucleosomal environment and the other tail experiencing a tetrasomal environment and thus just um, do a weighted average of these two curves, you get the dashed line here. And what you can see is that this dashed line actually um, fits quite well to the, um, the experimental data and so supports that um, and supports the idea that indeed the accessibility of the H3 tails um, is influenced or regulated by uh, the nucleosome composition. And so we, we come to a um, you know, proposed model here for how subnucleosomes might differentially regulate um, X, um, the H3 tail. So the H3 tails are sensitive to the uh, assembly state um, and the tails, the dynamics and accessibility of the H3 tails increase upon dimer loss. And so one thing that's really interesting to think about is how um, the tail uh, the tail accessibility might be linked to DNA accessibility because we know that the reason the reason why um, the conformational ensemble shifts is at least in part due to the fact that the, the DNA conformation shifts. And so it's really interesting to then think about the linkage between the DNA conformation and the tail conformation and what are the biological implications for that. Um, because if we return to this model from before wherein we have um, you know, the, the accessibility of the tail severely uh, limited by interactions with DNA. And if we think about, you know, shifting these towards a more accessible ensemble of some sort, um, well, there are many ways to do this. Um, you know, we mentioned earlier um, histone post-translational modifications and the nucleosome composition, but also there's the idea that there are adjacent, um, in many of these regulatory complexes, there are adjacent DNA binding regions. And so if we're increasing the accessibility of the tail, which was previously shown by Poirier's lab um, and others, and if we're increasing um, the accessibility of the histone tails, then, and we have a, a H3 tail binding domain and a DNA binding domain, then think about the cooperativity of that will mul multiplicatively increase the overall affinity of that complex for the subnucleosomal particle. And so it's another way of, of of regulating um, specificity for, for different complexes. Um, and so with that, I just want to very briefly um, um, oh, um, go over um, where, where my lab is kind of starting to go from there. Um, and so we're, we're, so before we, we were looking at, it was more of a qualitative look at um, the H3 tail dynamics. And so now we're moving into a more um, quantitative um, uh, measure of the tail dynamics and within uh, to, and looking at the nucleosome and the tetrasome. And so here I'm showing a uh, fast time scale dynamics collected via solution in arm. And um, I just want to point out a couple of things with these two T2 measurements. Um, uh, they can kind of highlight some um, dynamic hotspots. And here you can see that the profile between nucleosome and tetrasome looks similar. And similar to what was observed by the Selenko lab before, we have these, uh, what seems to be hotspots uh, by the double glycine repeats. And so this is something that we're interested in and in, you know, looking into more. And then also if we look at the heteronuclear NOE, which is a readout of flexibility, you can see that overall the tetrasomal tail is more flexible, sorry, a lower number in for of HET and OE, a lower value represents um, higher mobility or flexibility. And so the tetras, it's con this um, confirms that the tetrasome um, is more mobile than the nucleosomal H3 tail. But interestingly, um, both um, uh, species have kind of this increase in, in flexibility uh, right next to where it protrudes from the core. Um, and other directions of, of where we're going from here um, in, um, are, are really, in addition to subnucleosomal species, I'm really interested in looking at the overall energetic landscape of the histone tails and how the accessibility and intra versus internucleosomal interactions are regulated by charge modulating histone PTMs and variants. 
And so with that, I would like to thank the Musselman Lab, uh, thank Catherine Musselman for a great postdoctoral experience. I'll thank our collaborators, the Wierzynski Lab and the Poirier, and Michael Poirier, um, and additional funding sources for this research. Um, and then uh, in moving to MCW, um, uh, thank uh, the people who have joined or rotated through my lab. Um, and then of course, funding sources. And I also want to mention uh, that we are recruiting um, members to join our team. And so please feel free to contact me um, if you want to talk. Um, and I'll mention that MCW is located in beautiful city of Milwaukee. And uh, much to my chagrin, I learned that this brewery, um, while I thought that their cool sculpture here was of uh, nucleosomes, it is uh, in fact a cagnado, but I will continue to think of it as, as a nucleosome sculpture. Thank you very much, Emma. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, so we are starting to get a couple of questions. So, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking I'm just gonna go ahead. Oh, and we also have somebody with their hand raised. Okay, so I'm gonna ask one of the questions from Felix Jonas. So he's asking, is it possible for two exomers to reassemble to one octomer and one tetramer in vivo? And could this influence your results? In vivo or, or in vitro? It says in vivo, but... Oh, also, I'm, I'm not sure um, what, what would happen in vivo. In, in vitro, I don't think that we're seeing... I think, I wonder, perhaps the question is right. Are, if you have um, a mixture of species in your sample, might, might you be, instead of having a, a hexamer, um, or a hexasome, might you have like a tetrasome and an octasome and it, you just think you have a hexasome? Uh, and assuming that's the question, what I, sorry, I didn't um, go over these gels much. These are, this is a, a native gel um, on the different samples. Um, and so tetrasome, hexasome and nucleosome run differently. And so in addition to like the denaturing gel showing the, the ratios of the his, different histones, I think the, um, the native gel shows us that we have a distinct species rather than like a mixture um, with, within these. And so hopefully that answers the question, but um, you can certainly talk to me more about it if you want. Okay, well, Felix, if you still got more questions, you're welcome to raise your hand. Uh, speaking of raised hands, we have Pallavi. So I'm going to unmute you and whenever you're ready, you can ask your question. Hello, yeah. Uh, amazing talk. Actually, uh, one of your future directions was going to be my question that uh, in terms of looking uh, PTMs and all. So I would continue that. Do you uh, wish to include the DNA methylation also in terms of uh, changing this uh, ensemble? And this, uh, uh, what if the DNA methylation could also be a factor in changing the uh, absolute versus new? Yeah. And, uh, and also including transcription factors that are more so, I would say, uh, like chromatin remodelers, that how do they change this uh, ensemble and create the new rearranged? Right, now you ask, um, yeah, there are a lot of interesting directions to move with this. And yeah, thinking about how the nucleosome assembly state, histone PTMs, DNA methylation, like so different um, epigenomic factors, how they all like crosstalk, communicate, and are, are interlinked. Um, and I think there's, yeah, a vast, uh, complex, all these levels of regulation that um, we've only um, scratched the surface of how they are all working together. And so it brings up a lot of really interesting questions that I, I don't have an answer for yet. But, you know, I think, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of, um, of really interesting work to be done here. Um, and I guess I should also mention that uh, Lewis K has a, a recent study out where he's looked some at uh, DNA methylation. So you might wanna check that out. Thank you. Thank you, Balabi. Um, so there's a question from Mike Carey. He asks, uh, can you test whether the accessibility leads to a functional consequence in vitro, such as increased acetylation of H3 by P300? Yeah, so um, yes, that would be, that would be 
definitely a good um, study to do. So we use Tripson as more of like a global readout of accessibility since it has, you know, um, multiple binding cleavage sites along the tail um, rather than, um, you know, I think most readers, writers, erasers, whatever, have um, a specific region they bind to. So this was more for a global readout. But I do think that, yes, absolutely, the next question is then, well, if we test it with, you know, readers, writers, erasers, do we, do we indeed um, see the um, change in observed affinity or, um, or activity that we would ex expect, predict from this trips and data? So you're absolutely right. That would be um, a really great next step, but I, I have not run those tests. Okay, um, so we have a couple of questions that are very similar. So they're both asking about the absence of the H3 tail. Would this affect the nucleus and the structure? And could the tailless H3 could be used as a control in the experiments to further support the models and the dynamics, for example? So this was asked by Jude Rice and Ben Wheatley. Okay, so how it would affect um, the dynamics of the whole particle if we remove the tail? Yeah, so the, um, yes, those are, and the stability, absolutely. There are um, a lot of interesting questions with how the tails contribute to um, overall uh, particle uh, stability and dynamics and how, um, again, like the linkage between the core and the tails. There are a lot of great um, studies and or questions there uh, to be followed up on. And um, I think you're absolutely right that if we remove um, the H3 tails, then we will very likely see um, differences in uh, confirmation and stability of the remaining particle. Um, but I don't have an answer for you on that right now. But those are all like, yeah, yeah, great things to, to think about. <laughs> and, and research. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Lots, of, lots of future directions. Yeah, I mean, uh, see, so yeah, for example, there's another question that I guess it also goes into these facet of what else could be happening in vivo. Uh, Daniel Verbal, he's asking, great talk. Do you have any idea, for example, if euchromatin have more tetrasomes than nucleosomes? So, um, so Frank Pugh um, had a, like a genomic study um, uh, where he, where they observed uh, subnucleosomal particles in vivo and um, and the existence of hexasomes and petrosomes. Um, and then I think there are some other labs that have looked at this some too. Um, I don't want to misspeak, but I believe that overall hexasomes are found near um, active genes. Um, and they're known from people like Srinivas Ramachandran um, that um, hexasomes um, are, for, well, and others that um, hexasomes are formed um, from the passage of um, RNA pole two, and and then there's some evidence that hexasomes regulate um, RNA pole two, um, and so right. So are the, well to get your question was, I, I do not directly know the answer to your question, um, but there is evidence I think that these subnucleosomal particles, at least hexasome, are found enriched in active genes. I believe, um, but. Uh, Petrosomes, um, I'm not sure. So I, yeah, I, I better just stop there. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. That's great. <laughs> um, so there's a, another question from Jason Fan. He says, do you think the more unwrapped pre-nucleosome as biochemically characterized by the Cadonaga lab would more resemble an exosome or a tetrasome in the H3 tail dynamics accessibility? Um, Sorry, can I ask you to repeat that once more? Yeah, so the question is, do you think that the more unwrapped pre-nucleosome that was characterized in the Cadonaga lab would more resemble an exosome mm -hmm. or a tetrasome nucleosome in the H3 tail dynamics? Well, so I guess I would think it would more resemble the tetrasome, but then, but the hexasome, you know, we think we have one tail of each, right? And so I think any tail that's then by um, an unwrapped part of DNA would, would more represent, or sorry, uh, uh, be more similar to the tetrasomal tail than the nucleosomal tail. Okay, great. 
so I think that's that's about it. So we just hit the hour. If you don't mind, can I ask you a question of mine real quick? Mm -hmm. So I'm more of a transcription oriented. So I was really intrigued by this auto inhibited ensemble that you described when all the, the coll this collapsing of the histone tails and the DNA. Do you think, or can you speculate in, into how this can affect directly, or could it present itself as a roadblock to pull to transcription, for example? Yeah, and so, um, yeah, absolutely. So I think it's, um, right. So the, the, again, it kind of speaks to the linkage potentially between the tail dynamics and conformation and the DNA dynamics and conformation and how, right, they influence each other. And um, hmm. I, um, well, I think that, yeah, the, the idea of the asymmetry within the hexasome and having differential accessibility um, and how that um, uh, ties into like um, transcription, I think it is all connected. And I think there are a lot of implications here for how um, transcriptional machinery or passage of RNA polymerase through the hexasome and the fact that it's been observed that the dimer is um, during elongation is preferentially lost from the distal side and then how that might feed back and regulate things. Um, yeah, I don't, um, I think, it, I think it, it is all related, but I don't yet know how. <laughs> No, thank you for your. Which answer. might not be very satisfying. <laughs> no, no, but new concepts to think about. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much for your presentation, for your time thank of you. being with us. And thank you, everybody else that has stayed with us during this QA and for asking your questions.